Yeah, thank you to the organizers uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about RNA modifications. I hope I'll manage to pass on some of my excitement for this very nice nascent field. So I'm a scientific co-founder of Elida Biosciences. We are a small startup in San Diego, and we are focused on developing methods for detecting RNA modifications. And we have launched our first product just a month ago, which is a platform um, for detecting M6A and Enoseam. And I'll talk about this now. So what is known is that there's a large variety of RNA modifications. 170 have been detected. For most of them, we have no idea what they are doing or where they are located in the transcriptome. And this number may seem a little daunting, but in humans, you will only find 50 if you count the unique bases and the sugar modifications. You, these modifications are absolutely vital for survival. If you knock out the protein machinery that installs them, the cells will not develop normally or in mammals, um, the organism will die. So this is because RNA mods play a really important function in nearly all aspects of RNA metabolism. For example, alternative splicing, um, trafficking in the cell, translation initiation, and of course, stability and folding. There are many reports about deregulation of RNA mods and many diseases of aging with late onset. For example, cancer, neurological diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer, and also cardiometabolic conditions like diabetes too. So when we started the company four years ago, very few people knew about RNA modifications, and they have become a little bit better known by um, a report that was released by the National Academy of Sciences last year that details in 250 pages a technology roadmap for RNA modification research. So this report is driven by the insight that RNA modifications really increase the diversity of the message. They can be installed either during transcription or after transcription and they affect how mRNA is processed and spliced and can be understood as like the punctuation at the end of a sentence. It just makes, gives a, a description how to use the message. So there are, it's developing technologies for RNA mods is a vibrant field. There's a new method every month, um, but few are commercially available. Really, um, the only other commercial al alternative currently is our nanopores, which are, of course, also a very elegant solution. So there are already exciting applications of RNA mods, and I don't have time to talk about all of them. I just go through them pretty quickly. So there's opportunity for biomarkers. Here's one seminal study where researchers analyzed uh, different brain tumors at different stages and were able to categorize the stage of the brain tumor based on the type and quantity of RNA modifications. There are a few companies that have started targeting the machinery involved in RNA mods uh, with small molecule drugs. Here you see uh, data from Storm Therapeutics that have an anti-tumor effect. Also, plants have RNA modifications. Uh, there is a study that shows if you engineer a human M6A razor enzyme into plants, you can increase the crop yield of rice or potato by 50%, which is a pretty impressive effect. You can edit RNA by making an A to I mutation. And of course, RNA vaccines have only really been successful after incorporating one methyl pseudouridine, which doesn't only stabilize the RNA, but also um, increases the immune tolerance. And one can only imagine what vaccine you could tailor if you could copy exactly the natural modification pattern. So RNA modifications differ by RNA species. The most modified molecule is really tRNA. Here you have 20% of the bases are modified and they occur at very defined places at very high modification stoichiometry and the function is mainly structural and, and folding related. 
And there is impact on translation fidelity because the wobble loop of tRNA contains modifications and interacts with the codon in different ways. In mRNA, we find much fewer modifications. In terms of mass, the most prominent modifications are M6A, inosine, and pseudouridine. And M6A is dynamically re regulated, and it, in fact, there are studies showing that it responds quite quickly to environmental stimuli like poisons. So we care most about those three modifications. And adenosine is really important because of its dynamic regulation. So it's installed by metal 3 and removed by two eraser enzymes, FTO and OCBH5. And then there is a large class of YTH reader proteins that catalyze downstream processes involving translation, um, half-life of um, mRNA splicing and nuclear export. And um, important processes regulated this way are blood cell maturation, development of the nervous and the reproductive system, and also can cancer cell growth usually is associated with an upregulation of M6A. Inosine is read as, as guanosine by the cell and therefore occurs predominantly in non-coding regions. And the function is uh, as like, you know, marking double-stranded RNA regions as self to distinguish them from double-stranded RNA viruses. If you have an excess of unedited double-stranded regions, um, it triggers an immune response, and there are reports showing that um, some chronic diseases like arthritis are uh, associated with the decreased activity of ADA1, which performs these edits. Aside from that, there can be an indirect effect on splicing and regulation by microRNA by editing of non-coding regions. So here's our Epiplex platform. It has two components. It's an RNA library prep kit and the EpiScout analysis software. And the idea here is really to give researchers a complete end-to-end -end solution that gets you in three days from purified RNA to the, the, the results. The RNA encoding uh, or RNA library prep kit is based on proximity barcoding. Some of you might know this from the O-Link technology. So what it is, is you have a molecular recognition element, in this case, a protein binder that specifically recognizes the modification. And then we transfer a barcode to the target RNA. And this barcode is read together with the RNA sequence to infer the identity of the modification. So proximity barcoding is inherently scalable and enables targeting multiple modifications in one reaction, which saves input amount. Here's how the whole workflow comes together, and I want to point out three details. So one is that every kit includes spike in controls, and our algorithms use these controls for internal normalization. Then the molecular recognition element are uh, non-antibody binders that we involve in-house. I'll talk more about that. And the proximity barcoding occurs by reverse transcription, which is important because you don't want any crosstalk between the different B types. So the reaction must be really fast and optimized for that. Here, just to illustrate the problem of recognizing a teeny tiny target like an RNA modification, which is often just a, a methyl group. Um, antibodies are like a thousand times larger than the target. So we use small native RNA binding proteins, and then we use yeast display to evolve them for high specificity. Here's the result of um, the affinity we get for our inosine and M6A binder. They are in the low nanomolar range. And another advantage is they are small bacterial proteins that have protein tags, so we can orient them on the bead surface and really have very close control over coverage. The spiking controls are um, 
made from exogenous DNA by in, uh, in vitro transcription. And we have a whole pool of controls in there. There's positive controls with different modification densities and negative controls. And you see here a standard curve we construct where you see really a linear response between RNA mod density and uh, the response. And so we use these uh, controls, of course, as quality control for signal normalization. It gives us the dynamic range of the experiment. And in rare cases, when we have closely related modification, we, we could use them to correct for a little bit of crosstalk. The EpiScout software combines open source elements that are modules that are used in any analysis of sequencing data with our own modules. And the key piece is really a, a machine learning based peak caller. We could have used um, things like Max2 that have been developed for um, histone modification calling. But we wanted our own peak caller to train it on many features of the signal. So the signal is really read pileups like peaks, as you know, from ATAC-seq or, or CHIP-seq. And what the software does, it is, normalizes the raw data relative to the input control and the spike in controls and then performs peak calling and the scale peaks. So how do you know the results are what they're supposed to be. So the software also looks at sequence motifs under the peak. So for inosine, we have hard truth because there's an A2G mutation. So you can quantify how many peaks have an A2G mutation. And uh, for M6A, we know that metal three edits the drug motif. So we find that M6A is enriched in the three prime UTR and um, inosine occurs mostly in the introns of the CDS. So the machine learning based peak caller makes sense of the shape of the peaks, but it can also take into account sequence motifs under the peak. So one problem when developing these methods is there's no ground truth. Um, for inosine there is, but for most other modification there isn't. So there's a variety of things you can do. I list them here and I won't talk you through everything. Um, I just uh, want to jump right away to experiments with cell lines that have writer knockouts. So first though, I want to point out the method is very sensitive. We can uh, easily detect RNA modifications in 50 nanograms of total RNA, which is about the amount you get out of a blood biopsy or degraded tissue samples. So you see here really good uh, conservation of the signal across a 20 fold range of inputs. This is an interesting experiment we've done in collaboration with Richard Gregory uh, using STM15. That's a small molecule drug that's in clinical trial developed by Storm Therapeutics. It's tested as a leukemia drug and it inhibits metal, uh, metal 3. So what you see here that we can quantitatively m measure how M6A counts go down with increasing um, inhibitor concentration. And you see that in the total number of peaks, but you also see when you look at the fold enrichment of in treated versus non-treated, that the peaks that remain are much smaller, so the relative abundance decreases. So such relative quantitation is really important for biomarker development and, and drug development, and it's a feature many other methods don't have. So we now depress the M6A signal. This is an uh, uh, example how you can upregulate the M6A signal. So M6A is uh, installed co-transcriptionally and um, by metal 3. And metal 3 cannot access the intron exon junctions when the exon junction complex is active. So we did experiments where we either knocked out an important component of the exon junction complex or added an inhibitor for what a helicase that's involved. And you see in both cases, the number of M6A edits in the intron exon junction really goes up. 
So this uh, result is summarized in a bioarchive paper if you want to see the details. So I jump this slide. So here, where we really want to go is large, uh, you know, studies with large cohorts of cancer or other disease samples, where you can see here very clearly that we have significant changes between tumor and normal tissue. And you can then take these genes that are modified and feed them into gene clustering to learn more about the pathways that are um, affected. So I need to come to an end here. So I've shown you how proximity barcoding can be used for detecting RNA modifications. And the method is really dependent on the availability of uh, very specific binders. And once we have those available, we can scale the assay. We are currently working on adding pseudouridine. The idea here is really an end-to-end -end workflow. Bioinformatics is included, and you can access um, clinically relevant sample types. In the future, we want to go into diagnostics, targeted applications, and you can imagine also applying this concept of proximity barcoding to other targets like histone modifications. Okay, with that, I'll end my talk. And I want to thank my wonderful team and also the sources of funding. And if you have, if you happen to study a disease condition that may depend on RNA modification changes, reach out to me and we are very uh, interested in collaboration also of this type. Thank you so much. I think we have time for some questions. Also, young people, uh, diverse audience for questions, please. I see a hand in the back. Thank you. Uh, not very young, but still. <laughs> that's, that's also OK. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> so yeah, my question is about this uh, proximity barcoding. So how far away you get this signal from the actually modified base, what is the base resolution of the method? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so the uh, resolution depends on the fragmentation length. The uh, assay currently is dialed in to produce 140 base pair fragments. So this is our resolution. However, we are working on adding single base resolution by generating patterns in the reverse transcription signature. Uh, there is for some modifications, naturally, RTs, uh, you know, have a stutter, put in a deletion or a mutation hotspot. So this would be the next phase of the product. Hi. Nice talk. I was wondering, so you focus on two modifications. Um, tRNAs are full of modification. Is it applicable already on the tRNA sequencing or not? Yeah, to be honest, I don't think tRNA is the best target for our Epiplex method because it's so dense um, and it, it is just, I think it's something that's better tackled with other methods. Let me chip in with maybe a final question then. Um, coming from a bacterial background, does this apply as well to bacteria, both your kit as well as the modifications? I know bacteria do have them, but... Yeah, bacteria have their own set of modifications, some of them quite weird, like curacine, like large bulky ring systems. Yeah, they, so they do have modifications. But your kit is not based on poly-A uh, library prepping, or is it? No, not necessarily. There are multiple workflows. You can do total RNA or poly A enrichment. No final question. Let's thank Gudrun then once more. Thank you.